Anybody here been hit in the face with life lately? Yeah? I was at a church a few weeks ago. In this particular church, uh, I was there because uh, all three pastors had just recently had the virus. And several other people had had the virus. And it's just amazing to see how different communities uh, get faced with different types of, of adversity. But show of hands, who here has been hit in the face with life in the last six months? Last year. The last year. Anybody? Okay, yeah, a lot of hands up there. A lot of adversity. You know, today's uh, Bible selection that we're going to be reading from the text is in Luke 8, and it's verses 22 through 25. So if you have your Bibles, you might get that out. But you know, as we go through these storms, as we go through these things in life, the one question I always like to ask is, how will God get the glory? You know, today we've celebrated this baby Jesus But let us not be confused. We're not celebrating just the birth of a normal baby. We're celebrating this all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present Lord who's here, who loves us, who's with us right now, who's all-present. And so maybe you're like me. Maybe you've been facing some some battles and some adversity, and you've had some, some hardships. Christ is here. He is present with you. And... um. In those moments, I always ask, how will God get the glory? And that's what we're going to ask today. In those storms, how will God get the glory? If you would, Luke 8, verses 22 through 25, I am reading from the Christian Standard Bible. If you can, can we please stand, if you're able, stand in reverence for God's word. One day... He and his disciples got into a boat, and he told them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they were sailing, he fell asleep. Then a fierce windstorm came down on the lake. They were being swamped and were in danger. They came and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we're going to die. Then he got up, and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves, so they ceased. And where and there was a calm He said to them, where is your faith? They were fearful and amazed, asking one another, who then is this? He commands even the winds and the waves, and they obey him. And this is the word of the Lord. You all may be seated. The first thing we take away from this is, number one, Jesus' commands must be carried out. His commands must be carried out. We see this in verse 22. He says, let us cross over to the other side. So there's the command, followed immediately by action of obedience. So you have a command followed by actions of obedience. So they set out. But let's not stop there. Let's let's back up. Let's go to the beginning of verse 22. One day he and his disciples got into a boat. See, if you're taking notes, this is what I would write down. If Christ sends his disciples... He goes with them. If Christ sends his disciples, he goes with them. If he's called you to a place or to a a work, you have no reason to fear because he is with you. This was true in the Old Testament with Joseph and Moses and Joshua and David. It's true in the New Testament in this story, in the road to Emmaus and, and Peter's prison break. And, of course, with the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. So what can I learn from this? Our first application would be this. Be willing to go and serve as commanded. Now, this sounds pretty easy, right? Eh, It's a little bit more complicated than that, isn't it? We're comfortable. We have things the way we like them. And when God asks us to go do something, he's asking us to get and step out of our comfort zone, to do something for him rather than specifically for ourselves. It's still scary, but we know that we're not alone. He's with you. He's with me. But we still have our our reasons and our excuses not to go. But let's think about this. 
Do you believe this application that we are to be willing to go and serve as commanded? Do you believe that? Okay. Now, many of us believe it, but the truth is, is that we have those reasons why we don't want to. And when that happens, the opposite is true. We are unwilling to go and not serving as called. And we have to be careful of that. We have to. Now, I need to back up. A person can be a believer, but not a follower. You guys might scratch your head and say, well, what do you mean? Let me explain. Now, it says that this is a purified drinking water, and it looks like water. And maybe you guys have drank some of this stuff before, too. I have previous experience from this. I, the evidence tends to point that this is water. So knowing that, seeing this, reading that, I believe this is water. Does believing that this is water make me less thirsty? No. It requires action. If I want to be less thirsty, I have to do what? I have to drink. So excuse me, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to take a drink. Thankfully, it is water. So the same is true with our faith. Many know about Jesus. Many even proclaim him as Lord. But until we start following his commands, trusting him in faith, and living out what he taught, are we a follower or are we simply a believer? And let me go one step further. James 2.19 says this, You believe God is one. Good. Even the demons believe and quiver. So let's talk about this. Demons believe Jesus is Lord. They even have an emotional response. They, they quiver at his name. Do they follow? No. If you're going to write something down, I would write this down. Faith is belief with action. It requires action. My life has forever been transformed, and I pray that your life has been too. And if it hasn't, you will have an opportunity today to respond and, and, and to experience God in a whole new way. And some of us will say, well, yeah, I'll, I'll get to, when I get to heaven, I'll get to experience God. You can experience him right now. You can have a real relationship here on earth with Christ, trusting and following him every step of the way. And you don't have to be some religious superstar to do it, okay? I'm a normal guy. You know, there's normal people all throughout here who have seen their lives transformed simply because they made a choice to follow and to trust and to obey. Number two, expect the storms to come. Expect the storms to come. No one likes this part of Christianity or life, but I think everyone who's ever lived life knows that storms come. Verse 23, and as they were sailing, he fell asleep. Then a fierce windstorm came down on the lake. They were being swamped and were in danger. They came and woke him and saying, Master, Master, we're going to die. A few words stood out to me. And the word suddenly appears. These are seasoned fishermen. You have to know something. This was no regular rainstorm. If it was, they would have been able to spot the forming of rain clouds, and they would have found safe harbor. No, this was something else. In this version, it says fierce windstorm. Other versions use the word squall or fierce gale. More likely, this is an eastern winter windstorm blowing off the Golan Heights volcanic plates. Okay? It's a windstorm can't be predicted. They didn't know it was coming. And they are terrified because they don't know how to go about getting to the other side when this windstorm hits. And it says that the boat is being swamped and that they're in danger. <laughs> What's Jesus doing during all this? He's asleep. He's asleep. I don't know. Um, I, I see some parents out here 
I've gotten trained to where like I can wake up like at the sound of a cry anymore. Are you guys like that? Can can you guys wake up even like a a, a bang? You're you're up, right? Jesus is is in the middle of a windstorm and he is sound asleep. Well, let's back up. Why did this storm come up in the first place? Well, some people actually think it was the work of the enemy. Some people believe that he didn't want Jesus and his disciples to get to the other side. So he's going to throw something in front of them that's going to be an obstacle and make it difficult for them to get there. Well, it makes sense. After all, when they get to the other side, the very first thing they do is they drive out demons. Others theorize and say that this happened so that the authority of Jesus could be established, so that all would know that he has complete authority, even over nature. Okay, well, either way, storms are going to happen, right? Are you going to be blown by the storm, or are you going to be firm in your faith? Now, let's see. Jesus, he was in control the entire time. When you follow Jesus' commands, we can expect the trials, right? Anybody ever expect hardship or trials just because you were trying to follow God's command? Yeah? We can expect it. Even opposition. And even when you're scared and, and you can't silence your fears any longer, who can you go to? Who can you go to when you're afraid? Jesus. Jesus was there. Which brings me to point number three. He is all powerful. He got up and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves. So they ceased and there was calm. And he said to them, where is your faith? They were fearful and amazed, asking one another, who then is this? He commands even the wind and the waves and they obey him. The word rebuke. In the Greek, it is epitomeo. And it means to rebuke, to denounce, or to command. So let me get this straight. Guys, you might look on that manger this Christmas, and you might see some little helpless, small little baby. Mm -mm. Our God is all-powerful. He's all-powerful. You know, when I was reading this, uh, my mind immediately went to Genesis 1. We've seen this before, haven't we? And the Lord said, let there be light. And there was light. He spoke things and, and, and commanded. And things came to be and things came to happen. Jesus has full authority over nature. Hmm. He is fully God, fully man. Jesus asked us, or asked his disciples, where is your faith? It's almost like he was saying, hey, guys, you're with me. Do you really think the wind and the waves have authority over me? Don't you know me? Haven't you been with me? Stand aside. And he tells them to be quiet, and they're quiet. Not the disciples. The wind and the waves. Okay, so what can we learn from this? Well, trust in the Lord to lead, guide, and instruct. Here's what we've established so far. So far, number one, if Christ sends his disciples, he goes with them. Number two, we know that Jesus is always in control. Number three, we know that Jesus is all-powerful. Not even, not even a, a windstorm like phased him. All right, it didn't bother him the least. Now, at some point, if it hasn't happened to you already, I pray that you will learn not only to believe these things, but to rely upon these truths, to act upon these truths. See, we know them, but until we act upon these and trust in these truths, that Christ is with us, that he's in control, and that he's all-powerful, then honestly... If I'm, if I'm being completely upfront with you, we're living on limited faith. Don't be limited. Trust in God's power. Rely upon it. The reason why we exist and live is not to have a nice house. 
It's not to have a good job. It's not to go to college. It's not to fall in love. These are all blessings and they're good things. I'm not saying anything bad about them. But the reason why we exist is to bring glory to God, to be used by him for his work. And guys, let me tell you, there is no greater job we can have on this earth than to be servant of the one true king. I know the king. I get to live out his commands. He uses me. And get this, out of 7.5 billion people in the world, he knows you. (laughs) Isn't that crazy? He made you with purpose. He loves you. And he has a plan for you. Number four, God gets the glory. So it was hard, but they eventually, they made it to the other side. And what happens? Well, this is what happens. Luke 8, 26 through 9 through Luke 9, 6 says this. Jesus drove out demons. He heals a woman from a 12-year illness. He restores a young girl back to life. He commissions the 12 disciples, and then they go, and they proclaim the good news, and they heal, and lives are changed. Hmm. Lives are changed. What can we learn from this? Live your life with purpose and with boldness. Don't live on limited faith any longer. I was one of those guys. I had different purposes for my life. When I was young, my purpose was to be on the radio. I was. I even made it into a top 30 market. It was awesome. My friends were jealous. I had the job everybody wanted, talking sports on the radio, and I was absolutely miserable. It wasn't until I committed my life to Christ that I found purpose, and I realized I <laughs> there's something greater to this life than me. There's something greater to this life than me. When you make the purposeful decision to not just believe in Christ, but to follow Christ in action, your life will never be the same. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because others may not. This Jesus, I'm telling you, he's amazing. He changed my life forever. And for some of you, you may have been holding back. You may not have yet made that decision to follow him and to make him Lord of your life. So often, others, we may have asked him to revolve around us, to fix our problems, to solve my issues. But we're thinking about it wrong. We're backwards. We exist to bring him glory. Therefore, we shouldn't expect him to come and revolve around us. We should expect our lives to revolve around him, serving and honoring him. So maybe you're one of those people and you need to, you know, you need to make a change. God is calling you to something and you have been scared for a long time to do that. Don't live in opposition to God's will. And remember, whatever situation you may be going through right now, God will still get the glory. Let us pray. Blessed God, um, thank you for who you are. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to worship together, to praise you. You are so worthy. We love you, Lord. Because of Jesus Christ, we have hope. We have a future. We have a victory in Christ. Lord, we know that You're calling us to be obedient and to be faithful to whatever you call us to. I pray for this congregation. I pray for those at home, Lord, that no matter what we go through or what we're dealing with, that we will be obedient and faithful and that you will get the glory. May we glorify you with all we say and all we do. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Well, as Scott had mentioned, the Lord may be working in your heart this morning to respond in obedience to God's word, 
to seek to glorify God in, in your life with faith, uh, to, to step out in faith and pursuing what it is that God has called you to do. What a great testimony of that in your life, brother. And we look forward uh, to hearing more about that here in a moment. Um, But we don't want to just hear the word and let it go in one ear and out the other. We want to be, as James 1.22 reminds us, to be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving ourselves. Scott had mentioned that even in his sermon. We're not just to be hearers, but to be Doers. So however God may be um, working on your heart today, we want to respond now to God and his word. We're going to sing a song here to close. And uh, as we do that, let's think about how we might apply what we've learned from God's word this morning. Just as we do every single week. We are hearers and doers, or, or we ought to be. So let's respond to God's word, however it is he might be putting on your heart. And just know that this, that your pastors are here, Wood and myself. Uh, Scott will be here afterwards as well to talk to you. We'd love to be able to further hear how God might be working in your hearts. Let's respond in song. Would you stand with me as we sing?